Let's talk about race. You know, you can't see the money can't be eaten. Assassins, right? It's where you be. Once again. But I got some help for you. Check this out. Here's the escalator. World dominator. Miseducator. Boom, toon, walk to the devil's lair. This virus of racist faces contagious to all types of places. Gotta peel layers off, and it ain't gonna get done soft. Discussion can stave off the bussin', fussin', bum rushin'. Politicians filibusterin', ways to usher in eugenetic disruption. Won't terrorize those with open eyes, not dealing with fakes who just wanna sit around and theorize. Meanwhile, in the street, another pair of police state hate related victims. The mind's eyes lay lifeless Looking at concrete Many topics, many ways to drop it How did we get here? We're going to start beginning to talk about the important moment in history when you're talking about the United States and its slavery, which is the Civil War. The Civil War, as most people know, was a moment in which many Southern states in the the United States sought to secede from the Union because of a growing pressure to end the practice of slavery in the United States as a whole. Now, the reasons for why slavery was beginning to be uh, phased out of law and practice in the United States, they're numerous. The most important ones being that uh, the economy of not just the United States, but the world was beginning to phase into an era of uh, pre-modern industrialization, or one may even say early modern industrialization, where the hand labor that was used in the slave trade in order to harvest resources was no longer efficient and no longer necessary. In addition to that, there's also aspects of international pressure, whereas the largest powers in the world in particular, the empire of Great Britain and the empire of France had already phased out slavery in this regard from their societies and from their legal systems. And so that was beginning to weigh in the United States whether or not it would be able to follow suit in a timely manner. Either way, the point is the industrialized North, particularly in New England and in the tri-state area, had already long since moved away from being uh, reliant on slavery. As I had mentioned previously on a different slide and in different segments, those states were never completely reliant on slavery such as the Southern states. And so this was a growing pressure that the North was putting on the South to abandon slavery altogether for these economic reasons that I had described. The southern states, which did not want to relinquish what little economic power and authority that they still had, which was still completely reliant on slavery, began to seek alternatives, seeking out long-term plans for how they would be able to continue to use slavery as the bedrock economic foundation to their ways of life and to their economic future, and how they would be able to secede from the United States in order to make this future for their economies and for their culture a reality. So eventually, this would come down to an armed civil war, where you had the forces of the Union and the loyal states fighting against the insurrectionist South and the 
states that formed the new confederacy. As many people may know, <laughs> I would certainly hope that the United States was victorious in this conflict and the Union would, after some certainly grisly and brutal conflict with the destruction of many Southern cities, would readmit the Southern states into the Union. Uh, the Lincoln quote that is most attributed to this is, mercy yields sweeter fruit than strict justice. And in doing so, despite the armed action against the Union that the Southern states did, they were readmitted into the Union and many of the same representatives were actually allowed back into their former positions. There was obviously strict tension in this regard between uh, loyalist politicians and former Confederates, but they were indeed readmitted and that would be very important to understanding exactly how the immediate post-Civil War politics and policies would continue to form. So here we have Abraham Lincoln and some quotes in regards to the motivations and the strengths behind the conflict in the Civil War. And it very much highlights much of what I was saying previously, which is very much so that the Civil War was a conflict that was fought over first and foremost economic reasons. There are obviously certain in, uh, you know, interactions and certain individuals that are tied to the Civil War that relate to other such aspects, such as uh, moral objections to slavery. You know, a very famous Union marching song during the Civil War was uh, in honor of John Brown, who was a, uh, a uh, white man from New England who tried to start a revolt to free slaves in the South. And so there's obviously certain interactions on the ground level amongst individuals that tie into this, but that's a very common thing with war anyway, is that you can always seek to make aspects of war be about moral things on an individual level, because that makes something easier to fight for. But as it actually breaks down from the top down, from the commander of chief, uh, commander in chief, in this case being Abraham Lincoln, you can see it, these quotes very much heavily point to everything being about the preservation of the union and the economic might of the combined United States. So an important aspect that comes into both things that happened during the Civil War, but especially continuing after the Civil War, is the effect that this would have on freed Black people. So freed Black people during the Civil War, because of acts such as the Emancipation Proclamation, were often freed to very little. Many freed Black people would uh, join Union armies as they continued south in order to uh, finish their uh, total war against the Confederacy. But even in acts such as that, that offered very little protection from things such as disease and poor quality of living, because oftentimes these were, you know, even marches done without, uh, you know, standard qualities and boots or clothing and things like that. And without having such things like clothing, shelter, medical care. These were issues that would spread rapidly throughout these recently freed Black communities. And this is something that would continue even after the end of the Civil War. Here we have some quotes and some imagery in regards to this, how often it was believed that this was a uh, natural reaction you know, that these freed Black people were being left to die, you know, left at the mercy of exposure. And uh, released into a society as legally free, but without any protections that one would associate with uh, standard quality of citizenry for any 
you know, developed nation of the time. Here we have a specific quote in regards to this, about this belief, about this held opinion that uh, Black people, once freed, certainly this is about getting rid of the institution of slavery, but even without the institution of slavery, it would still allow the Black issue to uh, solve itself, the idea that Black people would vanish. And like his brother, the Indian of the forest, you he must melt away and disappear forever from the midst of us. Here we have an important piece of history in regards to the uh, treatment of recently freed people during the Civil War, which is uh, Sherman Field Order Number 15. Each family shall have a plot of not more than 40 acres of tillable ground. So this relates to aspects of the Civil War like I was describing. So uh, General Sherman was a Union general that was in charge of continuing and uh, you know, permeating the total war campaign against the Confederacy, you know, burning many uh, southern cities to the ground as the Union Army was making sure to rout and crush the Confederacy as efficiently as possible. And while they were doing so, when they would pass through plantations and such, that had you know large numbers of black people, they would be you know liberated from their current positions of bondage. And as a military officer, he was able to give field orders such as this about how these uh, freed black people were to be treated. And this is a specific example of uh, much of what I was describing before about matters of moral interaction being uh, much more about individuals than system or policy, because this is showing a specific action that was taken by General Sherman as he was there, as he was marching, as he was going through the South through these plantations. And there's lots of record and letters that are often preserved from times such as this from General Sherman to his family back home about his exposure to the conditions of slavery, which he was unfamiliar with being from the North. And so these often point to how these things often happen and levels of individuality, but this is a field order. This isn't a command from Congress passed through the Senate. It's not even an executive order. So outside of the context of an immediate military action taken by this individual, you'll see that it doesn't actually hold much water going forward into history. So when you see what becomes of the land that was promised. So as many people should know, President Lincoln was uh, assassinated and he was uh, succeed, uh, succeeded by Andrew Johnson, who overturned the previously mentioned uh, field order given by uh, General Sherman. And so all of this land that was to be granted to uh, newly freed uh, African Americans was to be immediately returned to the wealthy planter class that previously owned them. You know, reasons for this obviously have uh, you know a significant number of uh, backings behind them, including you know standard bigotry or you know seeking to take you know you know uh, matters of uh, wealth or prosperity to this uh, long since oppressed class, which is an entirely new class also that's being introduced. You have a previous slave class that's now due to the defeat of the Confederacy and now freed people, but still uh, uh, a previously uh, established and will continue to be established as subservient or uh, even in, in many cases, subhuman class of person. And in addition to that, though, something that can never be denied and must always be remembered when you talk about these things is that it was a matter of political and economic expedience. The planter class of the South was the most powerful social class. They held the majority of the wealth, even after the destruction of much of their property and their plantations and the economic backing that these things were based on. And so in order to continue to try to hold the union together and have the Southern states appeased, 
many matters like this and matters like this were taken in order to continue to uh, seek the approval and the assistance of these powerful social classes in the South. Here we have amendments to the Constitution, very famously, that uh, would be very important for establishing the legal rights of African Americans. So we have the 13th Amendment, which formally abolished slavery. Then we have the 14th Amendment, which gives citizenship officially and equal protection of the law to all citizenry, which now includes African Americans. And then the 15th Amendment, which granted the vote to African American men. So now black men were able to vote because obviously at this time, women were still unable to vote. So black women could not vote. But now as male citizens, African American men were legally permitted to vote. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about race. Let's talk about race.